Realm presents Orphan Black, the next chapter, season two, starring Tatiana Maslany, Jordan Gavaris, Evelyn Brochu, and Christian Brune. Episode three. Oh, the straits are at it again. I just think no one else can really understand how lucky I am to be with someone like Donnie. Allison's eyes flitted nervously to camera two, positioned over Felix's shoulder. They were in the kitchen eating salad, because apparently that was what everyone ate on reality TV, or rather lifestyle content, which was how the producers of Clones at Home referred to their market niche. The salad was not up to Allison's usual standard. She'd used a bottled dressing and raisins instead of dried goji berries. I mean, he's just so big. Uh, I'm sitting right here. It was important, the producers had told Felix before his visit, to craft the right narrative after all the drama at Helena's book signing. The clones had to be recognizable as distinct and compelling individuals who were also totally normal, relatable people. Normal, in this case, apparently still meant white and uncommonly pretty and television thin, which Felix thought rather defeated the purpose. It was a lot to keep in one's head. Perhaps this was why Allison was being so strange. I hear Donnie has quite the fandom now. What's that like? It's crazy. Oh, they're not that crazy. Her smile was brittle. Her eyeliner was uneven, and her ponytail was unforgivably bumpy. No, it's super crazy. Like, really nuts. I can't even explain it. I... I don't think that people understand what it's like to go through life as a regular guy and then and then have this happen. Like, like I'm a pretty regular guy, right? <laughs> I couldn't say. I don't have much experience with regular guys. You're married to a regular guy. Colin's a regular guy. And, like, look at me. I'm, I'm, I'm not some Adonis. That's not true. Allison, honey, you're very sweet. But I think we can all agree that your stepbrother over here, for example, is... Way prettier than me. Allison scowled at Felix. She gave him a long, slow look that Felix suspected took in the fact that he'd switched moisturizers recently and it wasn't working out very well. I don't see what all the fuss is about. And this was the moment that Felix knew something was desperately, terribly wrong. The feeling persisted when Allison grabbed Donnie's face and promptly began sucking on it. It was loud. It was awkward. It was unseemly. It was as though a well-known Canadian director of body horror films had suddenly started directing Canadian lifestyle content. It was also the moment that another Allison burst through the back door that opened into the kitchen. Get away from him, you bitch! Allison didn't often think about having killed someone. Part of it was that it just never really came up. Her life was so busy. Allison just really didn't think about watching Ainsley slowly choke to death on her poorly chosen scarf. As Felix himself had said, she'd worn a scarf in the kitchen, a kitchen with a garbage macerator in the sink. It was something people were warned about. Really, she'd brought it on herself. Much like the clone who was wearing Allison's clothes and kissing Allison's husband had brought this on herself. Allison lifted the nine iron over her shoulder. Behind her, a lighting rig crashed and fizzled out. Just as it had when she'd hit Donnie with it that one time when they were going through a rough patch, the nine iron felt reassuringly heavy in her hands. Her hands themselves still hurt from the zip ties that imposter Allison, which was how Allison had begun to think of her, had used to keep her in the garage. But imposter Allison had no idea that true Allison had spent more than her fair share of time in handcuffs, both by choice and by chance. And she wasn't such a wuss that she couldn't dislocate her own thumbs when necessary. Imposter Allison pointed at true Allison. Stop her! She's crazy! She's one of those crazy fangirls! No, she's the imposter! One of the producers was whispering excitedly to a camera operator. Please tell me we're getting all this. The imposter suddenly threw her arms around Donnie, tossing her pathetic ponytail. She shot Allison a defiant glare. Tell us something about Donnie that only his wife would know. Well, for one, he doesn't like being kissed like you're some face-hugging alien parasite. Well... 
The room went silent. The imposter looked thrilled. Felix looked scandalized. And all Allison could see was red. She launched herself at the kitchen island, nine iron held high. Felix darted out of the way. Oh, shit. He tried grabbing the club out of her hands. Allison waved her hand to keep it out of his grip. His hand closed around her wrist. Honey, honey, I know it's you now, okay? Put the club down. No! I'm gonna break her face! We won't be so hard to tell apart then, will we? Donnie, help me! It's like the uncanny valley of the tools. Some producers managed to scuttle around the imposter clone. They began hustling her out of the room. Allison threw the nine iron at them. It struck the wall, hitting the Hendrix family established 2006 sign over the kitchen door and causing it to crash face down on the floor. She's the fake. That frigid bitch doesn't deserve him. Donnie, I love you. We're supposed to be together. I was made for you, literally. Allison whirled around to the TV crew. Which of you idiots let that insane woman into my home? How did you fail to recognize that she wasn't me? We're completely different. The producers and camera people all looked at each other sheepishly before one of them had the presence of mind to start dialing the police. Donnie took her by the shoulders. Allison, honey, I think we all need to just take a breath here. And... What you need to do is shut up and think about how you couldn't tell your own wife apart from some random clone, Donald. To be fair, it's not like it's the first time. The cameras swung on him. He carefully brushed his bangs to one side with an elegant middle finger and pitched his voice for optimal recording. Well, I mean, he has made this mistake before. Remember when Sarah pretended to be you for that Bailey Downs potluck because you were, well, shall we say, indisposed? Donnie had no idea. That was fun, wasn't it? I was tied up in the craft room. The cameras swung over to Donnie. He paled. Cut! Cut, cut, cut! She stormed out of the room and headed upstairs. She had scarcely locked the door of the ensuite washroom when she heard a tentative knock. Alison? Go away. I have English chocolate. Allison reached up from her position on the floor to unlock the door and let him in. Felix squeezed in through the door without opening it too much and flipped on the washroom fan. Then he grabbed the hand towels off their rings and rolled them up under the door jam. There. Now I'll have a tougher time recording us if we keep it down. Allison crawled into the bathtub. She accepted a candy bar from Felix and set it on the little bamboo bath tray where she kept her jade roller. Did he really not know it wasn't me? Didn't you know? Oh, I had a clock from the start. Her eyeliner was all wrong for one thing, and that ponytail, my God. Right? It's like she wasn't even trying. There was just no effort there whatsoever. When I think about how hard I tried. Allison withdrew the phone from her pocket. <sighs> I can't believe she left me with this. It's like she's never taken a hostage before. You're right. She was a rank amateur. Allison flipped the phone around to show its face to Felix. Do you recognize this number? It's American. Who do we know in America? Oh my God, do you think it's Vivi? <gasps> do you think she's even alive? Vivi? Allison? Arun? Allison, is that you? Yes, this is me, and not some complete nutjob imposter trying to suck face with my husband. That's great. Sorry to bother you, Allison, but this is urgent. I'm looking for Vivi. Have you seen her? Or heard from her? No, we haven't. Felix is here with me, by the way. I don't think he's heard from her either. Hi, Irene. Felix? Do you know if any of the others have heard from Vivi? Well, not to my knowledge, no. I mean, I suppose she could have asked one of them to keep it a secret, but I really doubt it. I thought she didn't like us. It's not that she doesn't like you. She... She just has no idea how to let people care about her. Well, that's a really good analysis, Arun. I'm really glad you're understanding each other's limits and boundaries. You know what they say, hurt people hurt people. <sighs> it was a long shot, but I had to try. What's wrong, Arun? She won't answer any of my texts or calls. She probably just needs time, mate. It's not like that. Sure. sure. No, seriously, it's, it's not like that. We don't even work together anymore. We barely see... I mean, what I'm trying to say is, uh... She took a vacation. And she never takes vacations. I didn't think the word was even in her vocabulary. Isn't that good? 
If she needed to take some time for herself and she chose to do so, isn't that for the best? Self-care is healthcare after all. Yeah, Arun, she's been through a lot. I mean, maybe she really did just genuinely need a break. <laughs> yeah, when she needs a break, she goes to the firing range. This is something else. And I think it has to do with all of you. All the clones. I, I went to her place and I got into her laptop and... <gasps> Oh, mate, really? That's low, even for the CIA. Isn't there, like, a South American government you could topple just to prove the utility of late capitalism or something? Shouldn't you be telling civil rights leaders to kill themselves? South America was the CIA. COINTELPRO was the FBI. You are a veritable font of knowledge, Alison. She said something I've never heard her say before. She said, no clone is alone. What, like that creepy Blythe Winston? Cosima listened with half an ear as, one by one, her sisters popped into the video call with a series of chimes. She was busy fetching Delphine a ginger tea and considering whether to grab the reflexology slippers that usually went with it. Almost six months into her pregnancy, Delphine missed her ankles. They were the first part of me that was ever pretty, she often said. It meant she was sensitive about her feet, and the idea that she needed fluffy mom slippers, like the housewife she actually was now, was a mortal wound to her vanity. Cosima left the slippers behind and instead grabbed the high THC body butter that always made Delphine's knees feel better. She settled in beside her wife on the sofa. They're all here. Wow, so Arun is absurdly beautiful. The microphone is on. I was just testing to see if you were still awake. All right, let's call this thing to order. Seconded. You are in Alison's bathroom? Yeah, that's weird. The acoustics are better in here, you Philistine. Is it always like this? Everyone opened their mouths to answer, but Charlotte spoke first. Basically, yeah. Why is CIA man here? <clears throat> About that. Arun here is Vivi's partner. I'm really not. Work partner. Uh, again, not really true. And she's gone missing. I believe I speak for everyone when I say, so the fuck what? Sarah, Arun is very concerned that something might have happened to Vivi. So why need talking to the Boston clones? Vivi hates us. She hates everybody. Mmm, that's a little harsh. She's just been damaged by years of institutional gaslighting, like we all were. She works for an organization that, like, specializes in psychological manipulation, and she was manipulated. We can't blame her for not trusting anyone. And you, secret agent man, should be able to understand that. I do understand it. How do you know it's not some secret mission she just can't tell you about? Yes, perhaps Vivi is assassinating someone. She's not assassinating anyone. You don't sound terribly convinced, mate. Well... Unless she's assassinating another clone, I find it pretty fucking doubtful. Arun shared his screen without asking. Kasima rolled her eyes. On the screen was a series of social media feeds, all of them belonging or pertaining to clones. Some of them were fan accounts or support networks. Others looked like hate groups, but they all centered on one person, Blythe Winston. Wait, isn't that... That's her. A lot of the clones calling the helpline are talking about Blythe. Yeah, the calls have been getting really scary lately. There are a lot of women out there who are really freaked out, especially after that thing with Helena at the bookstore. Why should they be scared? I was not scared. No one is saying you were scared, Helena. Maybe you all should be. Uh, Arun, what exactly are you saying? Vivi was looking into this Blythe Winston at a time when the number of missing clones is on the rise. That includes this one, Shannon Billings. Arun showed them Shannon's social media profiles. Most of the images were memes about the power of positive thinking and how it was always darkest before the dawn. Shannon's a longtime Blythe follower who has posted about wanting to join Blythe's mission, whatever that means. She's officially a missing person now. Her family hasn't heard from her in weeks, and she isn't the only one. Clones have been dropping off the grid for months. Now I can't reach Vivi. She's not reading her texts, she's not answering her calls, and now I literally can't find her phone. At all. Anywhere. On Earth. So you're saying she turned her phone off? I'm saying that I, 
A working member of the CIA with a high level of security clearance cannot find another agent's phone. Perhaps you're unfamiliar with our methods, but that's really not supposed to happen. Oh, shine. Yeah. Vivi had seen worse self-defense classes, but not many of them. The clone running the class was clearly just two days away from her last tap Tycho fusion class at whatever yoga studio would have her. Vivi knew little old ladies on the streets of Havana that were more intimidating than this lot. Watching a class full of clones try to throw a punch for the first time was like watching a dozen of her old selves. Before all the missions. Before the betrayal. Before Arun. The world is so dangerous for us. The world is dangerous for everybody. They hate us out there. The world hates women generally, as a rule. Well, you don't have to believe the same things I do, Vivi, but I think we can both agree that the genetic accidents out there beyond these walls are envious of who we are and what we have. What is it that we have? I mean, aside from this gorgeous property you have here, obviously, and zero cell service, yeah. apparently. <laughs> the lack of cell service is to protect us. Why do you think yeah. these women are yeah. learning to defend themselves? Yeah. Well, they've been attacked yeah. by their partners, their families, their communities. There are clones here who have lost their jobs yeah. for falsifying yeah. their identities, yeah. who have been cast out of their houses of yeah. worship for being abominations against God. You see yeah. that one? up there at the front of the class. That's Shannon. Shannon's here because her husband wanted to kill her. And she's just the tip of the iceberg. Vivi watched Shannon try unsuccessfully to throw a right jab. Her body didn't want to make the movement. It was as though her limbs couldn't imagine doing what had clearly been done to her. It's not safe to broadcast our location and it's not safe to allow yeah. unsecured devices that might be compromised from the outside. I made an exception, letting you keep your phone because I thought yeah. it would put you more at yeah. ease until you acquired a better appreciation for yeah. Haven. Given your own career, I'm certain you understand the risks to our security. That's why I want yeah. you here, where yeah. you can yeah. do some good. Ah. Vivi watched one clone try unsuccessfully yeah. to put another in a half Nelson. Maybe, but that still doesn't answer my question. What is it, exactly, that we have beyond our shared genes? How are we different than any other dysfunctional family? We have each other. You might not believe we're here for the same reasons I do, but we both know that no matter how we all came into this world, even if the original reasons were nefarious, we came here intentionally. Someone wanted us here. Someone willed it to be so. How many other people can say that? Together, they watched the leader of the class try to position a student to take a hit. It wasn't going well. Both the student and the teacher looked too scared to put any scuffs on the obviously new pads and masks they were working with. And that's why they hate us. We're meant to be here. We were wanted. Everyone else on this planet has to live with the reality that their entire existence is an accident, yeah. just happenstance. Just yeah. two people who yeah. crash together as meaningless and painful as a car wreck. Yeah. Even in vitro pregnancies are essentially games of chance. But we, our family, we were designed for yeah. this moment in history and we were born apart, but not alone. We had a whole family just waiting for us, if we only had the courage to join it. I'm going to ask you a difficult question, Vivi. Were the other ones supposed to be easy? Blythe's smile broadened. Her hand shot out and grabbed Vivi's before she could pull it away. Have you forgiven your sisters in Boston? Vivi flinched. Blythe held her hand fast. What? Have you forgiven them for forgetting you? Something hot boiled up from deep inside and coiled around Vivi's throat. Most of the women here are angry at their parents for lying to them. But your parents are gone. Your agency is exposed. There's no one left for you to be angry at. Except the other little girls who never tried to find you. But they couldn't try. We were all too young. You tried. 
You fought yeah. and fought. You asked again and again, where had they gone? Your parents had to make yeah. up a story about yeah. it because you couldn't forget. Yeah. Because you chose not yeah. to forget. And they never did the same. Can you forgive that? Yeah. Vivi wondered, yeah. was this the real reason why she had walked away from the clones in Boston yeah. and Toronto? Was this why she had gone back to an agency that had lied yeah. to her? and then failed to appreciate her? Was she angry at her cousins for no yeah. rational reason? Yeah. Deep down, was she blaming them for something yeah. over which they'd had no power or control? Something that happened to all of them when they were only six years yeah. old? Yeah. Something was taken from you, yeah. your whole yeah. family, and it made you angry, unspeakably angry. And until now, yeah. that rage has fueled yeah. you. But even rage burns out eventually. Yeah. And underneath it all is grief. Grief for what you lost. Charlotte plunked down the box of donuts at the front of the support group with more force than was strictly necessary. She knew that the other clones in the group would pounce on them. But as a gesture, it felt useless in the face of what was happening to clones generally. All the carbs in the world couldn't make up for discovering that your whole life was a lie. And Charlotte was the one who had made it happen. You know, you might try bringing some fruit and vegetables. Just because we're genetically predisposed to be thin doesn't mean we should tempt fate. Charlotte's gaze shot upward and she turned around. There, sitting at the furthest edge of the circle, was Rachel. Rachel wearing jeans, like a regular person. Granted, the jeans were probably worth more than a downtown rent payment, and the heels she wore with them were stilettos. But she looked normal, comfortable, settled. Rachel smiled at Charlotte. Charlotte smiled back. The meeting unfolded in much the same way that they usually did. Rachel was the only new element. At the end of the meeting was a self-care strategy session, wherein the other clones shared their plans for how to look after themselves and navigate clone-specific challenges from the outside world. This week, there were only a handful of clones. I heard Brittany went to that island. Which island, Carla? The one that Blythe Winston owns? Across the room, Rachel's eyes locked with Charlotte's. I want to talk about Blythe Winston. As one, the other clones turned to look at the new visitor. Rachel made an almost imperceptible change to her posture that instantly made her seem three inches taller. Her shoulders dropped back and her chin went up. Suddenly, she became the woman that was Charlotte's direct genetic precedent. And something in Charlotte felt safer, just watching her. There was an adult in the room, a real one. It wasn't all up to her. Here was someone else who knew what it was to be responsible for something that could change the whole world. And Rachel may have cracked under the pressure, sometimes, but she hadn't shattered entirely. She was still here. I'm not a good person. When the other clones started to protest, she held a hand up. It was her usual gesture in meetings for silence. Not that the other women in the group knew that. No, it's true. Blythe Winston attacked me in public recently for my time at Dyad, and she had every right to do so. All of you do. I knew there were more of you, and I said nothing. I knew you were sick, and I didn't help. I could have brought you together, and I chose not to. One reason I've resisted coming to groups like this is my assumption that everyone in them would be talking about how many reasons they had to hate me. The other clones in the group said nothing. Whatever they had expected Rachel to say, it certainly wasn't this. Charlotte had never heard anything like it either. Rachel wasn't exactly what people thought she was, that she could be nice or even kind. Kira believed she was nice only when it suited her, only when it meant getting something in exchange. What could Rachel possibly hope to get out of a conversation like this? But my therapist challenged me to try it. And I'm glad I did. Because I have something to tell you about Blythe Winston. 
Blythe Winston is a psychopath. It takes one to know one. We can smell our own. Blythe Winston is an opportunistic predator who spotted a vulnerable population and decided to entice them into her lair. She's a human anglerfish. That love and light bullshit that she's dangling will lead you straight into her jaws if you're not careful. I don't know what her true agenda is, but I do know that anyone who's truly enlightened doesn't spend all their time advertising how enlightened they are. When the meeting was over, Rachel came over to where Charlotte sat, staring at her notes. There was so much to write down. Too much. Too many stories. There was the clone who lost her job at a daycare center because the parents didn't feel comfortable with her around their children. There was the clone who suddenly stopped being invited to Bible study. There was the clone whose life insurance policy was suddenly canceled and the clone whose mortgage was now back in escrow as the bank went over her documents for the fifth time. And it was all Charlotte's fault. You're punishing yourself doing this. You're wallowing in other people's agony. You realize that, don't you? Charlotte didn't know what to say. Sure, Rachel was right, but that didn't make her choice any less disastrous for the other clones. Didn't she deserve some kind of punishment? Weren't these other women being punished for her choice when Charlotte herself had mostly escaped the wrath of the world? Didn't Charlotte have privileges that the other clones didn't, beginning with the knowledge of her own identity? So? The door opened and another group started to file in. There was an AA meeting that met in the same space. Apparently, Charlotte had been sitting in the room longer than she'd thought. Come. Rachel led her into the coffee shop inside the queer bookstore across from the community center. She ordered something black and bitter for herself and a huge hot chocolate for Charlotte, complete with homemade marshmallows brûlée under a tiny blowtorch. Rachel studied the formation of crema across her espresso before she finally spoke. This isn't your fault, you know. Yes, it is. I'm the one who told Kira to tell you were the instrument of fate. That's not the same thing as bearing responsibility. The responsibility doesn't lie with you. It lies with Westmoreland and Dyad and everyone else who kept the secret before you, including me. The instrument of fate? Rachel put down her cup and carefully lifted a marshmallow out of Charlotte's hot chocolate. She dabbed it on the rim of the cup so it wouldn't drip and then popped it in her mouth. Her eyelids fluttered briefly. Do you honestly think we could have kept the truth secret forever? It's the 21st century. There are cameras in every hand and on every dashboard. Facial recognition is becoming facial identification. Social media platforms can now predict family relationships based on matching faces. We were going to be found out sooner or later. We just made sure it happened sooner. Charlotte had heard these arguments before, most recently from Delphine and Cosima. Kira herself had made them back when they talked about releasing the information about the clones. But when Rachel said the words, Charlotte actually believed them. Why she did, she wasn't sure. Maybe it had something to do with the fact that Charlotte was cloned from Rachel directly, and that was a bond she shared with no one else. But it was more than that. Eight years ago, on Westmoreland's island, Charlotte had witnessed firsthand her capacity for cruelty. But she'd also seen that Rachel was capable of great kindness and gotten to know her in ways the Sestras never had. You don't have to avoid us, you know? Pardon? You don't have to stay away. They... we don't hate you. We're a family. We're supposed to be together. Rachel smiled as though she'd heard an inside joke. She took a sip of her coffee and set it down. Turn around and tell me what it says under that chalk portrait of Tolstoy. Charlotte twisted in her seat. She squinted to read the chalked in calligraphy. Happy families are all alike. Every unhappy family is unhappy in its own way. Do you know why they put those words on that wall? This place is full of people who have had to find their own families. Because not all families are meant to be together. 
Sometimes it really is all just an accident of birth. And sometimes that accident is more like a wreck. Sometimes it's an act of destruction, more than one of creation. Rachel finished her cup of espresso and stood. You're doing a good thing, Charlotte, but when your penance is finished, these women will still need help. So start thinking about precisely what kind of community it is you're trying so hard to build. Hello, Marjorie. Felix's agent, Marjorie, still preferred phones. It allowed her to be more intimidating, but it was a nice change from the helpline, so Felix took the call. Felix? When he was in trouble, she somehow managed to stretch his name into three different syllables. Uh, I'm sorry. Felix, I've had another chat with a client who wants to commission a mural from you. Is this a real mural or a mural of clones? The job is real, and so is the money. Mm -hmm. But the buyer just wants me to repeat myself. The buyer wants you to return to your earlier style and material, yes. Oh, well, that sounds deeply perverse and weird. And while I have no objection to deep perversion and weirdness, I draw the line at painting a mirror of my sister's just so some rich ponce can wank to it when his internet cuts out. You're assuming the buyer is a man, which she isn't. And we have no idea what the buyer wants this mural for, but we do know that her own brand is very hot right now, and that she herself is a clone. Felix's ears pricked up. And what we absolutely know for sure is that you don't have any other commissions coming down the bike, and your last two grant applications have failed. And you're the only artist with any kind of established brand working in this area of focus. Do you want this commission going to someone else, hmm? Someone who doesn't know the material the way you do? Felix hadn't really considered it this way before. Did he want someone else painting his sisters? Not really. But that was no reason to trample on another artist's right to expression. Well, shouldn't clones be painting themselves, or sculpting themselves, or whatever? There are over 200 of them, you know. Surely one of them is artistically inclined. Ah, <sighs> Felix. I'm going to be brutally honest with you, okay? I'm sorry, but I have to tell you the truth. And the truth is that an opportunity like this only comes around once in a lifetime. And you're squandering it! <gasps> you're getting offers for work, for publicity, for appearances, and you're turning your back on them just because you're angry that no one appreciates the way you've grown over the past ten years. Well, guess what? The Felix of ten years ago would have jumped at these chances because the Felix of ten years ago was young and hungry. But the Felix I'm talking to is getting a little too comfortable. Felix had no idea what to say. He stared at the studio space he was renting on Girard, not far from the house in Leslieville that was mostly Collins, with a nominal nod at the down payment from him. Was Marjorie right? Was he leaving opportunity on the table by maintaining his artistic standards? Was his entire career destined to be defined by Sarah and the others? Even Monet's water lilies were just a phase. He couldn't be expected to paint the same face forever and ever, even if it was for some up-and-coming clone influencer. Wait. Who did you say this mirror was for? I didn't, but her name is Blythe Winston. And she asked for me specifically? She has been, for the past three months. You've just been too good to take her calls. Well, wasn't that interesting? This wasn't just a conflict of his artistic interests anymore. Felix was being handed an opportunity to get a closer look at the very Lita who'd been smearing his sisters to find out firsthand what had happened to Vivi and other clones who were dropping off the map and get paid while doing it. Not a bad gig when you looked at it that way. And if Felix played this right, he'd bring back information his sisters could use. That Blythe Winston was a legitimate threat, or she wasn't. The others would hate the idea of him going off alone, of course. Especially Sarah. She'd tried to stop him. Failing that, she'd want to go with him. She'd insist on it. Which was another reason Felix would do this on his own. So Sarah wouldn't try to. Tell her I want to do it. Ah, uh, ju just like that? Just like that. Yes. I want to work with her. I want to meet Blythe Winston. I want to go where she is and see what she's doing. 
You're listening to Orphan Black, the next chapter, starring Tatiana Maslany, Jordan Gavaris, Evelyn Brochu, and Christian Brun. Created and produced by Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Orphan Black, the next chapter, season two, is executive produced by Tatiana Maslany and stars Tatiana Maslany, Jordan Gavaris, Evelyn Brochu, and Christian Brun. Based on the television series Orphan Black, produced by Boat Rocker Studios. Written by Melka Older, Madeline Ashby, Helly Kennedy, E.C. Myers, and Lindsay Smith. And produced by Marco Palmieri and Haley Wagreich. Associate produced by Nicole Otto and Diana Foe. And executive produced by Molly Barton, AMC Networks, and David Fortier, Ivan Schneeberg, and Jessica Shadlock of Boat Rocker. Performed by Tatiana Maslany, Jordan Gavaris, Evelyn Brochu, Christian Brun, Alyssa Zia, Vikas Adam, Taya Garland, Hudson Mako, Stephanie Shea, Daniel Bonjour, Stephanie Frame, Tiana Camacho, and Nathaniel Kwaku. Directed and produced by Kaylin West. Sound design by Rory O'Shea. Additional editing by Corey Barton. Musical theme performed by Two Fingers and composed by Amin Tobin. Music composed by Trevor Yule.